this is Think Tech, Think Tech Hawaii at the four o'clock block on a given Wednesday. And what do we do on Wednesday at four o'clock? We always do energy on Wednesday at four o'clock. Hawaii, the state of clean energy, our, our flagship energy program supported by the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. I'm Sharon Moriwaki. And today we have uh, a special, a sp the beginning of a special month where I'm co-hosting with Mark Glick and we're talking about HNEI. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Mark, what is HNEI? HNEI is the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And you know, it was created by statute and it's directed by statute to manage the Energy Systems Development Special Fund, that's the part of the barrel tax money, and also to uh, develop and leverage those funds and other funds into building solutions for our clean energy transformation. And these two young men here over here, Matthew Dubari and Mark Matsuura, they have something to do with that? They do. Um, you know, Mark Matsuura was uh, one of the leading engineers and the smart grid specialist at Hawaiian Electric. He actually was Hawaiian Electric's loss when uh, HNEI was, uh, and Leon Roos and, mm -hmm. and uh, Rick Rochelot recruited him uh, to help essentially build capacity to design these sort of unbiased solutions within HNEI. And Matthew Dubari, uh, Matthew Dubari. Matthew, did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. And, and, great. And, and, and pronounce your last name? Dubari. Dubari. Uh, is uh, one of the top uh, battery specialists in the, in, or researchers in, in the world. And this is a forum to actually allow us to present some of the most innovative solutions that are being designed, built, and uh, exported uh, from HNEI. Yeah, you know, uh, well, welcome to the show, Matthew, Mark, Thank great you. to have you here. We like to be near engineers and scientists as much as we possibly can. I'm gonna rub shoulders yeah, with we're you. good guys. <laughs> Especially in energy. And, and the thing about it is that, you know, people don't realize that HNEI is um, it's a scientific organization. Yeah. It's at the university. I know this because I ran into you at the university, and there you were, and you said your office was nearby, so I know I have confirmation right. that it's at the university, and it has been there a long time, and it has been doing Doing, you know, science uh, and engineering around clean energy since the beginning of the clean energy uh, initiative in this state. Furthermore, this is a fabulous laboratory, and um, so this is where you want to be to do science and engineering around energy right here in Hawaii. So these guys have a great, a great platform to do that. It's a really important organization, and I mean, you can't even think about clean energy in Hawaii without thinking of HNEI. That's true, and you know, uh, I haven't talked much about this yet and won't actually dwell on it today, but one of the things that caused me to want to uh, branch out from being energy administrator for five years, the only thing that could be better than that was to actually be part of the transformation efforts from the inside, the design and also deployment. Uh, we're at that stage. We're 27% renewable energy statewide, 54% uh, on Big Island, and actually to make these changes, we have to integrate uh, large rates of intermittent power and we have to figure out the transportation solutions and the grid integration. And that has to be done in a clinical, technical, unbiased, scientific way. And I felt like it could be more um, beneficial to the state in trying to help organize those solutions from a policy perspective. But these are the guys that are actually doing the work and. This month is about exposing that really intense and exciting work that's going on. Okay, at well, that's, that's a great uh, segue to actual exposure. Yeah. Okay, Mark, why don't you expose your work? <laughs> okay. Try to do this in a nice way. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> in an appropriate way, right? This is a family show, okay. you know. All right, all right. All right. Um, yeah, so we're, um, I'm part of a group within HEI. It's called GridStart. It's a grid systems technology advanced research team. It's kind of an acronym we put together. But uh, we focused on research projects. So our, when you say laboratory, our laboratory is actually the grid many times where we install batteries on the grid, we install smart inverters on the grid. So we try to look at what are the pressing problems that are are potentially impeding the progress to renewable energy in the future and try to come up with solution sets to kind of address those problems and hopefully clear the way 
so things can continue to progress. Yeah, so what so. kind of uh, experiments, research, development are you doing? Uh, for From a battery standpoint, which is what we're talking today, um, HNEI is, um, through the funding from Office of Naval Research, has uh, installed three batteries with, in partnership with one electric companies, one's on Molokai, one's on Oahu, one's on the Big Island. The Big Island one was first, and each one's kind of looking at different issues, I guess we think that batteries maybe can help address. On the Big Island, it was primarily wind energy at the time when it was installed, so we looked at um, what, is, what are the issues with wind power, it's kind of the fluctuations and frequency management. So we looked at wind smoothing algorithms, we, and then also frequency regulation algorithms, and seeing you know which ones, what's the pros and cons to those different algorithm approaches. Um, but we also wanted to balance the support of the grid with the help of the battery systems, is which where Matthew comes in, um, where we want to see if we have an aggressive response and we help the grid very much, does that just beat up the battery where it's going to die in two or three years? So, so and, and Matthew's kind of helping us with that life. Um, where do these algorithms live? Uh, within the battery control systems. So, so there's a battery, and then mm -hmm. it's a battery control system. Yeah. So Does that a, look a lot like a computer? Um, yeah, the control system's like a computer. I, I have a, a graphic that shows actual battery oh, system. Maybe we can want. call it up and you can... We, they can work okay. it, maybe. Okay, wa up. watch this. I, I wave my hands, <laughs> and bingo, there it is. How about that? Oh, How about impressed? So huh? there's the first slide, and we can talk about this one okay, if you want later. Uh, but these are the all the... second one. Let's yeah, go to the, the second one. the next one is the actual battery projects there you go okay. so nice so nice, what are we looking at here? nice pretty pictures um so the the one on the top left is on molokai so you see the big container is the actual battery cells and modules and things um in that one you can't really see the inverter but the next one on the right is the big island one at javi wind farm so you see the battery modules and then in front of that is the the container for the inverter that converts DC power into AC power, and it also has the um, the control system that controls the power in and out of the, the battery system. And actually, there's control systems throughout this whole thing, so they're all kind of working together, making sure the batteries are not being overheated and it's being operated within its limits, um, and, then also, and then taking signals from the grid and then providing support when needed. So, you know, we went to, uh, Think Tech went to uh, the Tesla facility in Kauai a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, are they using your technology? Are they running separate? And by the way, they're, they're supposed to engage another, still another battery facility over there, I'm not sure what company it is, uh, for a similar but not related mm. battery, um, you know, facility. And mm. <clears throat> just wondering, are they ahead, behind? Are they using what you're learning? Uh, could they? Yeah, we, we've, we've been in discussions with them that we haven't been directly involved with those projects um, but they're quite ahead and in a sense that they've done a lot of battery projects so if, if you want to look at the other graphic if you look at Kauai they have several large battery systems and the largest one was the most recent one I think you're talking about is 15 kilowatts and 52 kilowatt hours so it's basically able to take all of that solar energy and shift it into a time when the sun's not shining and provide energy, so kind of a dispatchable, controllable. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get to. I mean, so people mm -hmm. under, should understand mm -hmm. what the the algorithm and the controller do mm -hmm. for the battery yeah. and the, and the uh, you know the equipment that's attached to the battery. Mm -hmm. um, how does it? So it's it's not only gathering data; mm -hmm. it's processing data, mm -hmm. uh, and then it's telling some other piece of equipment what to do. What what does it tell it? Yeah, so it's, um, there's there's a lot of things batteries can do. So when people say, you know, oh, you're having trouble with integrating renewables, put a battery in. Well, what is that? What do you want that battery to do? And that's where the algorithms come in. So it can it can do energy shifting, like we talked about, taking energy from uh, a time when it's maybe not so much needed to a time when it's needed more. Um, it can take frequency signals from the grid and say, you know, if there's a the frequency slowing down, I'm going to pump some energy in to prop it back up. It can look at voltage, and instead of providing what they call real power, it can put in imaginary power, and don't, don't ask me to explain the difference between real <laughs> and imaginary. Um, but that imaginary power is, helps to support grid voltage on a system. And all of those things, um, when, they, when you talk about the value of energy storage, um, you, because it is a little bit expensive and prices are coming down dramatically, but it's still not cheap, um, you need to try to 
get as much value propositions out of it. So maybe you do energy shifting with some voltage regulation or with some regulation and try to get as many things out of that battery as you can, but so you can't do it all at once. So what's the, the purpose then of this equipment that and the and these algorithms you're working mm -hmm. out? What what are they intended to achieve, say on Molokai? <laughs> Yeah, well, Molokai is an interesting one because over there it's a five megawatt grid and a lot of times they only operate with two small generating systems. So say one of those generators stop working all of a sudden or you get a, a, a fault or a short circuit on the grid, the frequency deviates very, very quickly and very deeply. Um, and that can cause the PV panels to trip off and things like that. So the purpose of the Molokai one is to very quickly and that, um, jump in once it sees a frequency decay or escalation, quickly jump in and try to bring it back to 60 hertz. Um, the problem with that is is the, the system reacts so quickly that we had to jump in there within say like 50 milliseconds, I was kind of the target. And battery systems typically with the, the monitoring and, and algorithm calculations and then sending the command to the battery and then the battery output, all of that usually is a lot longer than 50 milliseconds. So we have to kind of re-engineer that to make it a lot more quicker. Okay, Mark, so, you would add something? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. and, and these are the critical uh, questions and that require answers that allow policymakers to uh, set rules and regulations on how you integrate renewables more reliably. Mm -hmm. So in these cases, you know, the, there was a presumption, well, the battery is the battery fast enough. Well, it turns out the batteries has wonderful responsiveness, mm -hmm. but it really was these other systems that have to integrate the battery into the actual grid mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. discovered by HNEI's work to be deficient and coming up with solutions to actually make those controllers work better, mm -hmm. right? Is that right. Better, yeah. better? The, the implication, yeah. though, is uh, from what you said, that it's what's happening, what you're doing, what you're learning, what you're writing in these algorithms in Molokai mm -hmm. are different. Mm -hmm. It's different than the That's other right. islands. Mm -hmm. Different experiment, yep. different result. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So you're, you're really uh, using all these three facilities as uh, is it three yep. or four, three, whatever mm -hmm. it is. For um, very different applications. Different applications, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the Molokai one is a you know, very fast response uh, system stability. The, like I talked about, the Big Island one was wind smoothing and maybe you know, slower time frames of frequency regulation. The one on Oahu at the Campbell Industrial Park, it's on a feeder that has a very high penetration of, of distributed solar. So that power ramps up and down and voltages ramp up and down. So we want to have that battery kind of maybe smoothing that power so that the, the voltage control systems that Kiko has at the transformers don't get beat up so much. It can kind of take on some of that burden and maybe to extend the life of some of the equipment there. When you polish this all off, Mark, mm -hmm. what are you going to have? You're going to have lessons that can be used mm -hmm. What in, in all of the battery facilities, mm -hmm. at least in Hawaiian Electric mm -hmm. part of the state, and maybe in Kauai too, mm -hmm. um, and um, you'll use them all. The lessons will all integrate at that point, yeah. right? They, you'll be using the benefit of all of these three experimental situations, mm -hmm. right? Right, so one, one of the missions at the university that I've learned since I moved from kind of industry into academia is you have to write papers. So uh, I was just joking with Matthew about that. Is, is I'm kind of a project guy, implement the project, get it done, get it working, and then, okay, now you have to write a paper. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, I can help you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matthew's very good at writing those papers, so we kind of lean on him a bit. But um, so, you know, so that, that's kind of the grid scale kind of things. We're also looking at um, the vehicle to grid kind of project. So where you have an electric vehicle, can those vehicles be used to help support the grid as well? Usually they're just pulling energy from the they're grid to charge. They're working on that too? Right. That's yeah, we, pretty exciting. Yeah, so we have a, a collaboration project like you talked about with Hitachi. Uh, it was funded by the Jap Japan government through the NATO organizations, kind of like their Department of Energy. Um, I think about $50 million worth. Um, and they're trying to now take that research project and turn it into actual uh, commercialized product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, working with Matthew is, is uh, what he knows about the battery cells and, and the chemistries and trying to forecast if we use the car battery to support, say, grid frequency or, or energy shifting, how does that potentially impact the battery and how do we make a business case so that you know the vehicle owner's happy, the utilities owner's happy, everybody's kind of made whole and, and we can 
further advance. So these papers that you write mm -hmm. and will write, they're intended to inform uh, policymakers, but they're also intended mm -hmm. to inform the utilities too, mm -hmm. because somebody at the top of the utility in some engineering capacity has got to make equipment choices and mm -hmm. connectivity choices mm -hmm. and so forth. So it's really yeah. for everybody, no? Yeah. And it's a key thing, Jay, that if, if the information is viewed as credible, mm -hmm. if it's presented in a scientific way, and it's done in a peer-reviewed journal, if it's done in a major conference, if it's done on, a, on a, an appropriate forum, uh, a meeting of, of scientists within a company or before the Public Utilities Commission, they can integrate those recommendations and make changes. Yeah, so and we're all on the same page. That's right. And we're all working at the best level we can work at. <clears throat> this may and result in standards. It may result in new technologies. It may result in more efficient technologies. All of those things improve essentially the way this system works. Mm -hmm. And it's being tested and proven here in Hawaii. Yeah. But because we have such high rates of renewable penetration, people are paying attention to it. And because HNEI is a credible player, they're also paying attention yeah. to what's being said. Okay, with that note, uh, we're gonna take a short break. And when we come back, guess what? We're gonna, call, we're gonna talk to Matthew Dubarry. And we're going to find out about some pretty sexy stuff around batteries. We'll be right back. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, exploring the world we live in, recognizing the changes around us, and looking into the future of our lives together in these islands. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha. My name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Living in this crazy world. So caught up in the confusion. Nothing is making sense. Okay, we're back, we're live here on Think Tech and Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Today, we're talking about market gaps in battery technology as part of an HNEI series this month. The first show today is about batteries. Next time, we'll do fuel cells. Time after that, we'll do PV. And time after that, we'll do, we'll do fabulous innovation in other areas, too. Mark Glick is helping me do these shows. He is the organizer of this month's study of HNEI. So, and our guest today, uh, we've, we've heard from Mark uh, Matsuura, uh, who works with, um, I guess, experiments involving, you know, integrating the batteries and the grid. Uh, but now we're going to talk to Matthew Dubarry, um, and he, uh, and forgive his French accent, sorry, because <laughs> I love it myself. Um, we're going to talk about some experiments that he's doing in order to try to understand batteries, the care and feeding of batteries. We need to know a lot about that. Tell us about your work. Yeah, so my, my main goal is to, to help Mark and to help our project to understand batteries better and to be able to diagnose them when they're on the field. So it's really easy to diagnose a battery if you can open it and do a lot of stuff to it. But when they're on the field, you cannot do that. So you need to develop methodology so you can understand the battery better, control it better, and make sure that everything is safe and everything is fine. And when Max talk about the different application, understand which one is more beneficial for the battery or not. And it's, when Max says a battery, for me, it's, it's not really the case. When you mm -hmm. talk about those BSS system, in reality, you have thousands of batteries in there. A battery is just four volts for a lithium ion battery. So if you want a megawatt size system, you're gonna have several thousand batteries in there. Yeah. We went over to, I told you, we went over to uh, Kauai, we saw the Tesla facility, and in these steel boxes, um, there's millions of batteries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe Little yeah. ones. Yeah, Tesla especially, to, to be way to, to use really, really small batteries, the same yeah. as in laptop computers. Yeah. So basically, we're trying to understand how they degrade depending on the application. And we start working on vehicle to grid, what, two or three years ago, starting from the idea that the utilities say, oh, it's gonna be great for the grid, but I wanted to look at from the EV owner, is it worth it in terms of battery degradation? Meaning that you're gonna get some money to feeding the grid, but is it worth in terms of additional degradation of the battery? So we did a study on that that we just published recently. And for the battery we tested, and again, it's 
every battery is different so we just tested one for now it seems that the incentive will need to be pretty high for the consumer to be uh, willing to do vehicle to grid but we need to do that again on different chemistries different applications we only did one case figure we need to do much more to really understand and help making policies on whether or not vehicle to grid can be a thing for the clean energy initiative or if we need to think about something else add more storage to the grid because people just won't do it part but part of your analysis is economics the cost uh, huh? well not me directly i'm trying to help them have a better understanding of batteries. Most of the models right now use black box battery models that are not realistic. And okay. especially not for the Hawaii application where we're not using the battery the same way they might in some other area. So trying to help them understand batteries better, give them a more accurate idea of how the battery is going to degrade, how fast. And so they can adjust the cost model. That's not my job, that's <laughs> their job. But I, I really like that working, and that's where we at Shenia, where we have experts in all those fields to be able to collaborate to mm -hmm. have those real deep understanding on the entire uh, aspect of the thing. But on your writing papers, too. Yes, I do, yeah. So uh, uh, you're, you're a long term, as opposed to others at this table who came from the utility, <laughs> <coughs> you're a long term a academic researcher. Yeah, I was, um, I've been an academic yeah. for a long time, and I'm, I, I tend to try to make it stick for the next 25 or 30 years because it's, kind of tired. it's getting a bit hard these days so tell us what you've learned i mean uh, you know because what i what it sounds like is that we need to know the best batteries i mean the, the best batteries and you know how they're made in material science and uh, how they're connected and um, how they're configured and all that so we can tell policymakers um, what to focus on yeah well, and utility companies what to focus on you know one of the main problem right now is how to control those several thousands of batteries and the way they control right now is really not that good uh, you're going to hear about state of charge. It's the way to know how much charge. So these are the same controllers that yeah. Mark was talking about. And I'm, I'm trying to improve them because right now the algorithm in them, they're, they're working okay, but they're not working great. And so what's happened is you keep a lot of capacity buffer on your battery so you don't go into the danger zone. But that also means that you're not using your battery at its fullest. So we actually developed an, some new algorithm to control battery better, and we patented it a few months ago, and now we're trying to validate it. And it's great to have Mark and all those... So you guys work together on this, oh, yeah. your algorithms and your material science. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm actually testing a lot of algorithms mm -hmm. on the BSA system, which is great to be able for me to, when I'm testing small cells, to be able to apply the same idea on a one megawatt battery. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great way, and that's what the work of HMEI is great, is we can take an idea from really the smallest scale. We make batteries that are that big, and we can test it on a megawatt battery just a few weeks later. So it's when you learn the, the truth of yeah, it. Yeah, you need to. <laughs> so you, you, on the one side, you want to you want to be efficient. Yeah. You want the battery to deliver. On the other side, you don't want it to deliver so much so that it blows up. Yeah. Yes, and, and you want to also to diagnose it, but you don't want to consume too much power making the diagnosis. If you think of an electric vehicle, if you spend half of the capacity trying to understand the battery, then you're losing half of your driving range. So it's important to have metals that are accurate, but also really mad in terms of resources, so we can diagnose battery without using the capacity of the battery itself. And so a big part, we, as we discussed earlier, a big part of this is testing and measuring yes. and having sensors and, and reading every little detail about that battery and how it's delivering or not. What do you use? Uh, I try to go away from sensors just because when you have 2,000 batteries in a battery pack, if I call those guys and <laughs> Too say, many sensors. Yeah, I know. <laughs> too expensive. So yeah. I developed methods just to look at the voltage of a battery. And if you're a matter of scientist, if you understand the electrochemical reaction in the battery and you track them, you can have a really accurate diagnosis without the need for any additional sensors, any... So you're just looking at the current. You're looking at the voltage. The voltage, yeah. And then when you, when you have the numbers from the voltage, that's data. Yeah. And then you have a computer somewhere that is analyzing that data and giving you some conclusions. No? Yeah, and we're trying to have that. Right now it's mostly by hand. Uh, we're going towards automation right now, and the, the patent is one way, and we have some of the methods to automate that. But yes, mostly that is from the matter of science under it, from a voltage response of a cell, you can learn all you need to know about the cell degradation without adding the need to destroy the cell or add any sensor. So, it's so really what have you learned so far? Well, you, a lot of the problem of batteries come from the, the, the lithium inside. You have a set amount of lithium in the battery, and that lithium gets consumed by some parasitic reaction through the edge of the battery. And that's 
mostly why you have some capacity loss. If you have only that, it's fine. If you start losing negative electrode, that's when you get at risk of lithium plating and all those kind of reaction that can be really dangerous for the battery later on. But and then you can find a way to prevent that. Not really. We can track them and we can flag ahead of time. I can call Mark and say, stop the BSS right now, yeah. change that module because we are getting into the dangerous territory where we think plating is going to start. And so that module might be at risk of bursting into flames soon. But at the end of the day, that'll be automatic. Hopefully, yes. So you don't have to call Mark. You just send yeah. another device a signal, <laughs> Probably, and it actually works faster than Mark could do it. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> and one of the other things that, that Mathieu is doing is trying to find greater value in that battery pack. So like in vehicle batteries, uh, they get discontinued at 80% yeah. of its degradation. So there's a lot of good use. What, yeah. You know, what are some of the things you're, yeah. you're doing there? Yeah, no, and absolutely. And I, actually, I, I saw last week a press release from Tesla. One of the main <coughs> problems is we talked about the state of charge meter, and that thing gets really inaccurate with time. And so at some point, you can have a case where your, battery, your car tells you you have 30 miles left, where in reality your car's going to stop. And I saw a press release of Tesla, that happened to them. Uh, I think of somebody doing LA, Las Vegas, and did a lot of miles. And at some point, the car says, I, can, I still have miles, but it stopped. And we're trying to find methods to make that more accurate. And the, the patent, again, is going to do that. It'll be able to have a better state of charge measurement. And by doing that, we can use less buffer capacity on each side, and we can use the cell longer because we understand it and we know exactly what mm. happened in there. And so we can flag whether or not we can still use it or if it needs to be replaced. And that's going to be also really interesting for battery second use. And we haven't mentioned it yet, but the idea is if they could grid don't catch, maybe we can take the EV batteries and put them on the grid. But there's a lot of problems there in terms of safety that we need to know if the battery is safe or not when it's close 20%. Can you use the 80 remaining percent or is it going to blow up after a few months? So it's going to be a lot of work to develop certification process standards, as Mark mentioned. Are, are you going to share your results uh, with Tesla? Are they going to share their research with you? Mm -hmm. Are you sharing your research with collaborators on the mainland? Uh, how, how open is this area now that you're at the front end of energy? I published almost everything. And even the patent, we will publish the inner mechanics behind it at some point. And just to make clear what that means, when he says it's published, that means it becomes open record. Yeah. So that's opposed to patenting right. or licensing a specific thing and keeping a proprietary right. right. So the tendency has been to actually allow anybody, including Tesla, to look at this information and benefit from it. That's great. That's great. And that's what we need to do in a way. We have to be open like that and we have to be a leader. So I have one, one more question that I'd like to ask Mark to summarize what we've learned here today in a technical and non-technical way, however you want. Um, <clears throat> so where are we in terms of finishing? I mean, this is like when, you know, when you reach the end of the internet, you know, <laughs> when are you guys done? When are you going to be in a position where you can make dispositive scientific conclusions that will actually let this all unfold? Let it unfold in the utility, let it unfold in the regulators, let it unfold for the public, or where we can actually move ahead, do the grid that we have been dreaming about for some years. <laughs> when are you going to be done? Hopefully the day before I retire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, for me, it's, uh, we're going to get new battery chemistries almost every year. And in the next decade, we're going to get probably some completely different type of batteries. And in a way, we're going to have to redo most of the work again, because those batteries are not going to react You'll the You'll never same be way. done. Hopefully not. Okay, well, good. Push off your retirement. You're a young man anyway. <laughs> what about you, Mark? Yeah, I think, um, like you said, it's, it, things are going to continue to evolve. And um, I think the research that we do, we try to look a little bit ahead and, and, like I said, try to clear the way so that things keep progressing. But it's not something where the, you know, things need to stop until we have some end date of our, okay, our research is done, we're closing the books here, now build it, right? So it's yeah. kind of, we're, our, as the grid evolves, as technology evolves, you know, our work is gonna continue and, and, and 
kind of inform the process as, as things yeah. progress. So even even after we get out there and do this grid building we've been thinking about, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of work to be done mm -hmm. to refine it going forward, mm -hmm. to wrap around new technologies and new demand. Okay, um, Mark, can you summarize all of that in one minute? That's going to be kind of hard, but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is that the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology and HNEI uh, as part a key part of that research institution uh, and part of the UH is to take some of these leading edge solutions and to try to build real understanding that will help move us forward on energy transformation. The battery technologies are being currently used, as you could tell, from small individual batteries, battery packs, uh, understanding, monitoring, uh, and coming up with uh, better understanding of where it sits at any given time. And then also looking at grid solutions, how do you integrate it into the grid seamlessly to help deal with intermittency? So, you know, all of these things are now being practically put into place to help us make continued progress to get beyond 27% renewable, to be able to get to 50% and 60% renewable. If we don't get these solutions, we're never going to be able to tamp down intermittency, wind and solar, mm -hmm. and be able to make that reliable, safe, operational power. But it is happening, and it's happening rapidly, and these guys are on the ground floor of that. It's very important. Batteries are so important to very make this work. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and thank you, Matthew. <laughs> it's been great to talk to you guys. Thanks for having us. We'll be back next week with more on HNEI. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Welcome.